All right, everybody, welcome back. Um, today, we're going to be diving into some really impactful research. Yeah, absolutely. Specifically, we're looking at JAMA Internal Medicine, Volume 185, 2025. Mm. And it's tackling a pretty tough question in healthcare. Mm -hmm. When do we stop resuscitation efforts in the hospital? It's a question that comes up all the time. Yeah, you know, current guidelines don't give us a lot of specifics. It's true. They're pretty vague. So it's no surprise there's a ton of variation in practice. Yeah. And that can unfortunately lead to some less than ideal outcomes. Right. You might be stopping too early. Exactly. Or even continuing when there's really no chance of success. But it's finding that balance that's so tricky. But this research offers a potential solution. They've come up with what are called termination of resuscitation rules. TOR rules. Exactly. And these rules are meant to guide these really difficult decisions. Okay. I'm interested already. So how do they come up with these rules? They were developed and validated using a massive data set of in-hospital cardiac arrest cases. So real-world data. Real-world data. And what's really fascinating about these rules yeah. is their simplicity. They're incredibly practical and focused. Okay. I like the sound of that. So break it down for us what makes these rules tick. They basically boil down to four key factors that are easily assessed during a code. Four factors. Okay, I'm hooked. Tell me more. The first one is whether the cardiac arrest was witnessed. Witnessed? You mean like, did a healthcare provider actually see it happen? Exactly. If no one saw the arrest occur, that's a point to consider. Got it. So if it's unwitnessed, that's one factor. What's the next one? Okay, the second factor is whether the patient was on continuous ECG monitoring at the time of the arrest. So was the patient hooked up to an electrocardiogram? Exactly. Continuous monitoring is key here. All right. So okay. witnessed arrest and continuous ECG monitoring. Got it. What's number three? The third factor we look at is the initial heart rhythm. Oh. Specifically, was it a systole? A systole. So you mean like a flat line? Yes. A systole essentially means there's no electrical activity in the heart. Okay. Systole, that's a pretty serious sign. What's the last factor we're looking at? The fourth and final factor is the duration of the resuscitation efforts. How long have we been trying to bring the patient back? Exactly. And if it's been at least 10 minutes, that's significant. 10 minutes or more. All right. So it sounds like all four of these need to be in play, right? It's not just one factor alone that would lead to a decision to stop. You're exactly right. The rule suggests considering termination only when all four criteria are met. And is that why this rule is so impressive? It's a big part of it, yes. This rule boasts a remarkably low false positive rate. How low are we talking? Only 0.6%. 0.6%. Wow, that's incredibly low. It is. It means that in 994 out of 1,000 cases, wow. this rule would correctly predict that resuscitation efforts would not be successful. For basically only 6 out of 1,000 times, would we incorrectly predict death in a patient who might have survived? That's right. That level of accuracy is pretty powerful. It's pretty incredible to think about. This rule seems like it could really change how we approach in-hospital cardiac arrest. It seems like it could give us a lot more confidence when making these really tough calls. I think it could be very helpful. But it's important to remember that these rules aren't meant to completely replace our judgment as healthcare providers, right? Absolutely. They're not meant to be a rigid protocol. They're a tool to help us make more informed decisions. So we're not just robots following a checklist. No, not at all. Clinical judgment is still crucial. We still have to consider the whole picture the patient's overall health, their wishes, and any unique circumstances. Exactly. These rules are just one piece of a very complex puzzle. They help guide our decision-making, but they don't dictate it. Right. It's about using these rules alongside our experience and understanding of each individual patient. This makes a lot of sense. So let's bring it back to the problem we started with. You know, the lack of clear guidance on when to stop resuscitation. How does this rule help us with that? Well, it provides a standardized framework that providers can use to make more consistent decisions about terminating resuscitation. So by having this framework, we can hopefully avoid those two undesirable scenarios. The inappropriate early termination. Yes. Where we stop too soon when a patient might have been saved. Right. And also avoid continuing resuscitation when it's very unlikely to be successful. Exactly. It's all about striking that balance. It's about giving patients every possible chance while also recognizing when further efforts are futile. That's the goal. So these rules could lead to better outcomes for patients. Potentially, yeah. And also help us use our resources more wisely. Absolutely. This is big. Yeah. But I'm curious, how would a provider actually use this rule in a real life situation? Okay, let's imagine a code blue scenario. Okay. You're part of the team responding. Okay. I can picture it. Everyone's rushing. Adrenaline's <laughs> pumping. 
We need to assess the situation quickly. Exactly. And you quickly learn that no one saw the patient arrest. Okay. The patient wasn't connected to an ECG. Their initial rhythm is a systole. Oh. Resuscitation efforts are initiated, and after 10 minutes, there's no change. So we've met all four criteria from the TOR rule. What happens next? This is where the rule suggests it might be appropriate to consider stopping resuscitation. So it's a signal to pause and reevaluate. Yes, but it's not an automatic decision. This is where your clinical judgment comes in. We still need to look at the whole picture. Absolutely. What are the patient's other health conditions? Do we know their wishes about resuscitation? Are there any other unique factors in their case? All of that needs to be factored in. So this rule helps us make a more informed and thoughtful decision. It doesn't remove our responsibility to think critically about each patient. Right. It's a framework to guide us, not a rule that dictates our actions. It sounds like this could lead to more consistent care for patients who experience in-hospital cardiac arrest. That's the hope, and hopefully even lead to better outcomes overall. It's amazing to think about the broader impact these rules could have. What else could we see change if they were adopted widely? Well, one thing that comes to mind is resource allocation. How so? When we can more confidently determine that resuscitation efforts are futile, we can free up those resources. Yeah. We can direct them to other patients who might benefit more. That makes a lot of sense, especially in a healthcare system where resources are often stretched so thin. Are there any other potential benefits you can think of? I think we could also see improvements in communication. Communication between who? Between healthcare providers and patients' families. I see. How would these rules affect those conversations? Well, having a more objective framework could make it easier to have honest conversations. That's true. We can better explain the goals of care, discuss the likelihood of success with resuscitation. Those are difficult conversations to have. They are, but having this evidence-based tool to support those conversations could be incredibly valuable. For both providers and families. Absolutely. It can make a very stressful situation a little bit easier to navigate. It sounds like these rules are just the beginning. We still need to figure out how to best integrate them into practice. How do we make sure they're being used ethically and effectively? We have to be very thoughtful about how we implement these rules. We need to remember that they are meant to support compassionate care, not replace it. Right. Ultimately, we have to remember that there's a human being behind every statistic. That's a really important point. Every patient has a story, loved ones' hopes, and fears. We can't lose sight of that. No, we can't. As healthcare providers, our goal is to provide care that honors that humanity. We need to see the person to buy in the illness. Exactly. I think it all comes down to open communication and shared decision making. It's about finding that middle ground between using these rules effectively. And still prioritizing each patient's individual needs and values. It's a balancing act, but it's crucial to get it right. This conversation has been a really good reminder that we need to constantly reflect on how we approach end-of-life care. It needs to be compassionate and humane. Absolutely. And it needs to be tailored to each patient's specific needs and values. I couldn't agree more. These rules are a big step in the right direction. They are. But they're just one part of a much larger effort to improve end-of-life care. It's an ongoing journey. This has been such a thought-provoking conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. It's been my pleasure. We hope this has been helpful and has sparked new ideas about how we can improve the care we provide. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.